Welcome to When One Thing Leads to Another, a podcast that takes you freewheeling down the great internet rabbit hole of trivia. Each week we pick a starting point and then who knows where all the twists, turns and tangents will take us. But we'll be sure to unearth a treasure trove of frivolous facts that will be as fascinating as they are, well, useless. When One Thing Leads to Another is produced and presented by us, Helen and Bill Rich. Our theme music is by Justin Mitchell. This is Series 2, Episode 11. Good darts. Now, the other day, uh, a good friend of mine, Ed, he WhatsApped me this newspaper article Mm. about the recently crowned UK Open darts champion. Right. And I thought, why the hell are you doing that? And then I realised that the newly crowned UK Open's darts champion used to go to school with me oh. and Ed. Andrew Gilding. Right. And in fact, he was in my form class. So he's done very well for himself. He's done very well for himself. And in 1984, I remember he sold me his Sinclair ZX Spectrum computer, complete with a slightly sticky shift key, if I remember, oh. which w- was a result of playing Daley Thompson's Decathlon with a little too much vigour. <laughs> But uh, yeah, no, congratulations to Andrew Gilding. That's very impressive. It's fantastic, isn't it? And this naturally led me thinking about darts. Arras. I like darts. The origin of darts, I thought I would have a little delve into. Unfortunately, we can't absolutely firmly establish when darts was sort of invented. There's not a nice, clean right. answer to it. Yeah. But it's thought that it started in the Middle Ages, in okay. fact, in the 1300s. Right. And a theory exists that an early version of it was played by bored soldiers who would kill time by um, hurling their arrows at upturned wine barrels. OK. Yeah. And whoever got it close to the bung that was in the middle was the winner. Right. And then some very bright spark, I would say, discovered that a section of a tree trunk would make for a better target because you've got the grow rings, which then then led to uh, the development of the scoring. Oh, okay. Well, that is interesting. Which is interesting. Uh, Even old King Henry VIII enjoyed playing arrows. Did he? Apparently. He had the physique of a dart player, didn't he? He certainly did. If um, portraits are to be believed. That's very true. And Anne Boleyn supposedly presented him, as a gift, a very blingy set of darts. That's hilarious. Which is pretty funny, isn't it? And the current scoring system, which we are all familiar with these days, came in around the turn of the 20th century. And I thought this was uh, really rather funny. Mm. Back in Victorian times, Mm. games of chance, that Mm. is to say gambling, was banned in pubs. Okay. Um, and in 1908, a publican from Leeds called Anakin was taken to court because he allowed darts to be played in his boozer. Oh. However, Anakin argued that darts was a skilled game rather than a game of chance. Right. Yeah, and it's not a game of chance, really. Yeah, and yeah. so a dartboard was duly brought into court and he challenged some court ushers or whatever you call them and magistrates to a game of darts. He won the case and he won the game. Thus proving that it is skill, not chance. Exactly. And good old so, Anakin. Good old Anakin. And so the laws were changed so um, darts could then be legally played in boozers. Fantastic. So all your talk of darts and Andrew Gilding, your uh, close personal friend. Indeed, the UK Open darts champion of the United Kingdom. It got me to have a little delve into the darts world. Uh-huh. Um, you know how darts players enter the arena to their walk-on music? Oh, yes. As if they're rocky. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And uh, Andrew Gilding's tune oh, is yeah. Spandau Ballet's Gold. Nice. Which led me to discover that Gary Kemp apparently wrote the song as a pastiche James Bond theme. Oh, right, yeah. Particularly Goldfinger, which also ah. happens to be Andrew Gilding's darts-based nickname. Oh, wow. So everything ties in very nicely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Talking of Gary Kemp, oh, of I. Spandau Ballet fame, of course. I delved into his past as well okay. and found a pretty incredible old video on YouTube of pre-famous Gary Kemp in 1975 singing a song called Sandman where he's being accompanied on guitar and vocals with a certain Phil Daniels of Quadrophenia (laughs) fame. Funny 
อาเป็นเนยเป็นเฮ Who he attended the Anna Scher Theatre School with? Yeah. Amazing. I know. And um, talking of Quadrophenia, yeah. I read with interest that Johnny Lydon screen tested for the lead role oh. in Quadrophenia, okay. but the film distributors wouldn't insure him. Oh. So Phil Daniels got the part. Well, I wonder why they wouldn't insure him. I. Who knows? He was just. <laughs> he was just too, too much, much of a liability. liability. And going back to Phil Daniels. Yeah. As a kid, yeah. Phil Daniels went to Rutherford Comprehensive School in Paddington, okay. which is the same school that um, Danny John Jules went to. You know, oh, Cat yeah, yeah. from Red Dwarf, okay. and he's one of the Merry Men in Maid Marian and her Merry Men. Yeah, and musician Paul Hardcastle. Oh, yeah. No, 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 nineteen. No, 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 nineteen. Yeah, he went to. He the went to the same school. school as Phil Daniels. Mm. Very good. And did you know that Phil Daniels plays a waiter in Bugsy Malone? Oh, is it? No, I didn't know that. He was also, Phil Daniels, a runner-up in Celebrity Masterchef in 2009, right. which is interesting because Masterchef was created by a bloke yeah. called Frank Rodham, yeah. who directed Quadrophenia. Wow, how about that? Quadrophenia director then creates um, Masterchef. Master Chef. Go from Quadrophenia to Masterchef. Yeah, how about yeah. that? Actually, yeah. it wasn't from Quadrophenia to Masterchef. He went from Quadrophenia to Our Feed a Same Pet. Oh, okay. To Masterchef. Wow. I know. What a varied career. Yeah. Quick question. Yeah. What do you think is the most common dish made on Masterchef? <laughs> Oh, flipping heck. I have no idea. I'll say it'll be something on a bed of juju. Uh, juju? Yeah. It's sea bass. Oh, okay. On a celeriac puree. Oh, okay. Or at least variations on that theme. Okay, so that's the number one most chosen dish yeah. on MasterChef. Interesting, almost. Yeah. The original and very different MasterChef of 1990 yes. was, of course, hosted by... Lloyd Grossman. The good old days. I was thinking, whatever happened to Lloyd Grossman? Well, he went on to make his sauces, didn't he? His he, yes. pasta-based sauces. He yeah. did. Well, he presented MasterChef for 10 years, but left after it was moved from a Sunday afternoon to a Tuesday night, right. saying, the programme is a dumb thing now and I don't want to be involved. Ooh. And when the new presenters, John Tarode and Greg Wallace, took over in 2005, Lloyd criticised their aggressive presenting style oh. and silly catchphrases. <laughs> and he famously, as you said, went on to make his pasta-based sauces. I like to think that he would be in a, in a pinny in his, in his kitchen there, knocking up these sauces and then uh, very humbly going to Sainsbury's and saying, please buy my sauces. But I suspect that's not how it happens. Anyway, I have found that Lloyd Grossman is a busy old chap. He is chairman of the Royal Parks yeah. and chairman of Gresham College. Right. A governor of the British Institute at Florence. Very a good. governor of the Compton Verney House Trust Blimey. and a trustee of the Warburg Charitable Trust. He is president of the Art Society <laughs> and patron of the Association for Heritage Interpretation. He has no free time, Lloyd Grossman. How does he does ever he? get the time How to make his sauces? How does he get the time to stir up his little sauces in his kitchen? They... Who knows? Anyway, did you know that Lloyd also was a guitarist right. in a post-punk band called Jeff Bronx and the Forbidden? Wow. And they had a minor hit in 1977. Did they? With a song called Ain't Doing Nothing. But you can come by in the morning, I ain't doing nothing, come by at noon, I ain't doing nothing. It got to number 50 that December. Wow. And finally, Grossman also dated a woman called Lady Jane Wellesley. Mean anything to you? No. She used to go out with somebody pretty famous. Go on. Then he was Prince Charles. He's the oh. artist, he's the king formerly known as Prince Charles. <laughs> And she politely declined a marriage proposal from him. Good grief. She dodged a bullet there. <laughs> and Lloyd was married to Deborah Putnam for nearly 20 years, she being the daughter of David ah, Putnam. Ah, David Putnam, the film producer. OK. Yeah. And we can tie up a loose end here. Yeah. Because Putnam produced Bugsy Malone, which, as we have learned, Phil Daniels had a part in as a waiter. Another lovely circle of facts. And talking of Bugsy Malone, I did some digging and you will remember the character Fat Sam. Fat Sam's Grand Slam. Yeah. 
and I remember him very well. He was played by a guy called John Cassisi. Okay. Um, and he got the gig after being discovered by Alan Parker, the director. Mm. Mm. Alan Parker was going around quite a lot of America watching um, school productions. Oh, yeah. He saw you know wow. hundreds of, of school productions mm. apparently. And anyway, he visit he was visiting a school in Brooklyn, New York, and asked a classroom of pupils who was the naughtiest kid in the class, and they all pointed to this John Cassisi. Wow. Who turned around grinning, and he said, "That he's my fat Sam." But things. I've gone a little bit awry for John Cassisi, a.k.a. Fat Sam. He gave up acting after Bugsy Malone and he actually went into the construction business and was director of global construction for Citigroup. Mm. But, check this out, he was sentenced to prison after pleading guilty to bribery and money laundering charges in 2015. Oh, wow, what a shame. He had, you know, the, the world was his oyster. And continuing with Bugsy Malone, characters mm. in Bugsy Malone, mm. you will remember, obviously, Jodie Foster yep. famously played the role of Tallulah. My name is Tallulah. Well, did you know that, this is going to sound like I'm going off on some weird tangent, but stay with me, the bloke who attempted to assassinate Ronald Reagan in 1981 was a bloke called John Hinckley Jr. Mm. He claimed to have shot Reagan in order to win the attention and impress Jodie Foster. He had a rather unhealthy, unhealthy obsessive fixation uh, over her. Mm. Anyway, I, I was delving deeper into um, John Hinckley Jr. because I was thinking, I wonder if he's still in prison. Mm. And it turns out he was finally released um, from 35 years of psychiatric care in 2016, Ooh. but with huge restrictions on his freedom. I think he had to live with his mother and couldn't travel outside of 30 miles from his from his mother's house and, and things like this. He was effectively under almost house, to, house arrest. Right. But he was granted full unconditional release in June 2022. And I've discovered he now has a YouTube channel on which he performs songs he's written. Wow. I got hope. Yeah, so that was John Hinckley Jr., the guy who attempted to assassinate Reagan in 1981. So, continuing on with Bugsy Malone, one of the, well, certainly one of the reasons why I love it and so many people do is, of course, the fantastic soundtrack, the music in it. Ding, dee, dee, ding, 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 dee, dee, ding, ding. Every tune is a winner on it's that one. The, it's a fantastic soundtrack. And the songs were written by Paul Williams. Mm -hmm. So obviously I then went on to check out his Wikipedia page and discovered that Williams has plenty of interesting shiz about him, mm. which I'd like to share with you now. Firstly, he wrote the lyrics to the Carpenters hit, We've only just begun oh, wow. to leave. White lace and promises. Yeah, lyrics written by Paul Williams, him of Bugsy Malone fame. He also auditioned to be in The Monkees. Oh. But unfortunately he didn't get the gig, obviously. Oh. And he's had a few acting roles in films too, uh, including he plays the part of little Enos Burdett in the three Smoke in the Bandit films. Like to kick his ass just once. Paul Williams also played the part of Virgil, who is the genius orangutan in the 1973 film Battle for the Planet of the Apes. Oh, OK. <laughs> Which I thought was interesting. Yeah, well, it is. Um, and... Uh, in more recent years, he has also collaborated with Daft Punk on their album Random Access Memory on a song called Touch, which he both co-wrote and sung. Oh. What a career, old Paul Williams. That is quite the career, isn't it? So I'm going to take Daft Punk and I'm going to run with them, if you don't mind. Go right ahead. Did you know that Daft Punk started life as a three-piece band called Darlin? No, I didn't know that. They named themselves after a Beach Boys song of oh. the same name. Okay. And in 1993, they released a track called Cindy So Loud. Cindy so loud, Cindy so loud. Which um, a melody maker, music journalist, described as a dafty, punky thrash. Ah, okay. Yeah. And so the band changed their name to Daft Punk. Ah, interesting. 
It is interesting, isn't it? I would say so, yeah. They then became the two-piece band that Were they more, have yeah. been more recently. I think the third member, by the way, went on to form Phoenix, the other French oh, groovy right. band. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I think yeah. that's right. Okay. Um, so, yeah, the band is made up of Guy Manuel de Homem Cristo Ooh. and Thomas Bangalter. Okay. And I found out that Thomas Bengalta's father... Yes. A bloke by the name of Daniel Vanguard. Right. Was a music producer also okay. and produced Ottawans. D I S C O. You're joking. D I S C O. Give me D. Delete. Give me I. Give me F. Super sexy. Give me C. Cute as candy. Give me O. One of Daft Punk's dad yep. produced that. That's yep. brilliant. And also he produced the Gibson Brothers' Cuba. Da -da 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 <laughs> oh, brilliant. Um, and, Interesting. Yeah, yeah. And Banana Rama's first single, a song called I Am Wana, was co written by Vanguard. <laughs> It didn't really have great chart success. However, John Peel played it. Right. Terry Hall heard it. Oh, of the specials, yeah. And liked it and bought it and then contacted Banana Armour and said, ah, do you want to sing on... On the Fun Boy 3 yeah. records? Yeah. How about that? So, yeah, that song was written by one half of Daft Punk's dad. Brilliant. Daniel Vanguard. And a very brief and cheeky tangent here is I was reading up on Bananarama, which yeah. was lots of fun. Yeah. Which took me unsurprisingly to Siobhan Fahi, one of the three founding members of Bananarama, of course. Famously. Um, when I was digging around, I discovered that her sister yeah. played the part of Eileen in the video for Dexie's Midnight Runners, Come On Eileen. Oh my goodness that me. That is Siobhan Fahi's sister. Well, blow me down. Coming back to Daft Punk, you know how they used to wear those helmets? Oh yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. They'd like to remain as incognito as they could. Yeah, anonymous, they? yeah. I, I discovered that those helmets cost $65,000 to make. Oh wow. And they were designed by a bloke called Tony Gardner. Okay. Who is described, at least on Wikipedia, yeah. as a makeup designer, special effects designer, and puppeteer. <laughs> okay. And I was amused to learn that he was the puppeteer in a few of those Chucky horror movies. Oh, okay. Remember those with the toy doll? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. they, were, they, were, they were horrible films. And he's worked on a bunch of films with various credits, including makeup effects designer on The Addams Family. Yeah, okay. Puppeteer on The Three Amigos. Okay. And uh, he did the animation of A Half Corpse in The Return of the Living Dead. Okay. And you know the film 127 Hours? Were the Danny Boyle film, you know. Oh, yeah, the he, uh, he's a rock climber or something, yeah, he isn't he? Yeah, caught and he has to oh, yeah, amputate he has... his own arm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Tony Gardner designed all the prosthetics and effects ah. that made that scene what it was. Pretty difficult to watch. Yeah. And this is the guy who designed the helmets for... Daft Punk. Daft Punk, okay. But the most interesting fact about Tony Gardner that I found yeah. was that his first professional job was working as an assistant on Michael Jackson's Thriller video. Oh, OK. And it is, in fact, Gardner who's the first zombie to emerge from the grave in the video. You're joking. That is absolutely fantastic, isn't it? That is brilliant. <laughs> Thank you for listening to When One Thing Leads to Another, a podcast produced and presented by us, Helen and Bill Rich. If you've enjoyed this episode, then please rate and review us on wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to subscribe, and that way you'll never miss an episode. We'd also love to hear from you, especially if we've got any of our information wrong, or you have some more fascinating facts about something we've talked about, or you could even suggest a subject for our starting point. Our email address is when one thing leads to another at gmail.com. A massive thank you to Justin Mitchell for letting us use his music as our theme song. It's a track called Homo Erectus, taken from his fantastical album called The Garden of Earthly Delights, which is available to buy from bandcamp.com. Thanks also to Acast for hosting us. 
Join us next week for another episode of When One Thing Leads to Another. Please note that all facts have been found on the internet and therefore we cannot vouch for their veracity. Mm-hmm.